The Dream, January 13th, 2019. John woke with a start. The dream had to do with his adopted daughter, Sally, who was going to be 16 soon. The devil had her, or she was sitting in the devil's lap laughing as if she was enjoying the attention. They were sitting in the chair that had been Lucifer's before the sun. John was watching from the railing on the west side of the sun. Dimitri was there with a gladiator's outfit on. Sword in one hand, spear in the other. John, I won't let him win this time. She is my wife-to-be. Dimitri, she's my daughter. Back me up on this and let me battle this evil. John suggested. Dimitri nodded. As you wish, my lord. John had the ancient sword of the Talifers of a thousand years ago. Why are you here, devil? John asked. This is my realm, John. What a fool you have been. To think that evil could be wiped out on one little planet in the universe. A thousand years of peace? Heaven on earth? What jokes? You as Abel argued for death for all of mankind so there would be growth. Now you argue the opposite. Time does not change things. You are starting to learn that time is a variable like all things. Don't mess with a good thing, John. The devil Satan laughed. You cannot win this time. When I was able, millions of years ago, mankind was so incredibly young, like a child not knowing the dangers and running into the street. Mankind has matured. It has learned the many lessons and is ready to take on the next step. John argued, So you want to put me out of business? When you destroyed Lucifer, I got this realm. I hate cold, so this is really nice and hot for me. The devil Satan laughed again. John, you have become Cain, and I have become Abel. Heaven forbids me to become you, John, in a million years. You sound like a hypocrite. You know those people in your life that tell you not to do one thing? Then they do it believing they can get away with doing it without you finding out. Parents do this all the time. Oh, darling daughter, don't have sex. The proof of the parents having sex is in the very existence of the daughter or other siblings. Such hogwash. I appeal to our Father God. I ask all of the saints that have ever come before or are here now or will be in the future to be my advocates in this matter. John shouted from the railing before the sun. The next scene in the dream was standing before God. John, why have you come before me? John felt like he had awoken God from a good nap. His tone was not pleasing. Father, I believed I was doing your service. Please advise me. John laid face down flat before God. He could hear laughter he did not like. John, when you face the enemy alone, you are not doing my service. When you look behind you and see enough family, friends, and neighbors standing behind you to win, and you did not ask them to be there, it is then that you are doing my work. You will struggle when you create hypocrisy in your life. Both you and your wife had sex before you were 16, and yet you think nothing of asking your daughter to wait until she is such. You go to a bare planet and dream of helping to create a garden. And yet, what have you done for your planet? When bigger ships are built with bigger weapons, you applaud. I have given you the tools to take mankind to a new and different place. One where the only discernment you must make is, Has this person in front of me been to God? If the answer is yes, then you have a right to treat others as you have been treated. If the answer is no, then bring them to me. God paused and asked, Do you have any questions for me? John realized the laughter was his. It wasn't the devil after all. Thank you, Father. I love you. John, a wise man, said to keep all things simple, and life would be simple. Oh, that was you, so... God laughed when he was done. My son, when the enemy comes knocking, simply answer the call. Do unto others as they want to do to you. Watch the seven-pound cat take on the 140-pound dog and see the dog run off in fear. I gave you a little dog that when she saw a cat, opened her heart and only wanted to play. What did the cat do? It either played nicely or ran off in fear. You're right, father. All the cats always ran off in fear unless they were willing to play nice. John remembered his little 55-pound golden retriever, the runt of the litter, but had the heart of a champion that was also full of love and play. John looked at the clock. It showed 2.43 a.m. He turned and put his feet on the floor. Where are you going? Jenny whispered. I'll be back. John whispered, too much water. John drained his bladder and went to the kitchen. 
What are you doing up? He asked Sally. I couldn't sleep, so I sent Dimitri a text telling him, I would fly out with you and transfer to his ship as soon as we met. Sally said, Dimitri sent back okay. Love you. I apologize for being a hypocrite, John said. This ought to be worth the price of admission, Jenny said as she came into the kitchen. Mom, am I still asleep? Sally asked. Why do you ask? Jenny asked. I've never read in the How to Be a Kid book for dummies that if your parents catch you up after 2 a.m. texting your boyfriend, that they will apologize for being a hypocrite. Sally smiled. I must be asleep. The two turned to John to explain. In my dream, God told me Jenny and I were hypocrites. We are asking you to do something that neither of us did before we were 16. John said, although I don't remember having sex until after I was in college. But you wanted to have sex, Jenny asked. Sex was like a new gun or new car or new toy. My memory is that I was never at the right place at the right time until I was in college away from home. John answered, I didn't have a choice. I guess if I step back and look at the overall picture, I needed to go through what I did to get here. I wouldn't trade that for anything. I love being here now. I Jenny said, Mom and Dad, I am having so much fun as a single attractive young lady. I have an extremely attractive young man, head over heels in love with me. I think it became very okay for us when I became Dimitri's angel in that last battle with the Nanugs. That went nationwide all over Russia. For me, the daughter of the President of the U.S. risking my life in their spaceship, saving Russians has made me a Russian celebrity. Everybody I meet calls me Dimitri's angel. Dimitri and I kiss when they do, and I acknowledge that I am. That has even gone on TV. We have been asked on TV when the wedding is, and I am pleased to show my ring and say the day after I am 16. You are helping to tie this world together. For it to be in love is as beautiful as a spring flower, John shared. This has not been planned, has it? Sally asked. Not by me. I don't think I have been 100% okay with this until right now. Maybe this is why God was upset with me. I, even though it was small, doubted in my mind towards the two of you. John said, Even though I did believe you two, like Tony and Willa decided to be together, somewhere in this life long before you came in? John answered, I think for me, when I saw you learning Russian, then I knew you would do anything and everything to make this work for you, Jenny said. It's hard, but Yelena, when she interviewed with me, said my Russian was getting good. She asked her audience and they clapped. She wanted to know how long I had been studying as a healer, how many times I had gone to God, how many times I had healed someone. I told them I had interned with my mother in our clinic since the first days of its opening, October of last year. Yelena then turned to her TV audience and told them, if this is your dream to become a healer, then this is a very good example of being the best. Realize Sally Taylor has also gone to school helped with many brothers and sisters, learned Russian, and learned to heal. Yelena then asked me what my dream was. I told all of Russia I wanted to be chief medical officer on an intergalactic spaceship with my husband, Dmitri. I think the audience fell in love with me. They kept me on when Vid and Dmitri came out. Both gave me a big hug on national TV. Yelena said later over 250 million people were watching. Vid and Dmitri shared the action along with some of the clips from the spaceships. I just sat there and looked pretty. Dimitri credited me with saving the ship when we got hit hard with two big energy weapons at the same time. The ship blinked, then continued as if nothing happened. John stood, a glass of water in his hand. Sally, I toast and recognize the adult you have become. You are making great decisions and I see an exceptionally good head on your shoulders. You make me immensely proud. You represent this family and this nation very well. It will be exciting for me to see you married. John and Jenny both raised their glasses of water and toasted Sally. It feels like I just accomplished something, Sally said. You have. Your dad and I just recognized you as an adult, Jenny said. That's really cool, Sally, Ben said. John looked and laughed. Who else is up? John kept seeing someone peeking around the corner. Ben looked at John real hard. You are doing fine, Ben. You are on the right path. Got more to learn. John said to that hard look. Like what? Ben demanded. Do you know how to make cookies? 
John got a yes. Do you know how to cook like spaghetti? John got a no on that. But I know how to barbecue, Ben said. Yes, you do. Do you know how to change a diaper? John asked. No, Ben said. Do you know how to stop the nanu next week? John asked. Yes, I do. Ben lit up like a Christmas tree being plugged in. John had heard the kids working on a plan. Come on in, Chuck. John said, Anybody else out there? In came Bobby, Willie, Lucy, and Beth, along with the twins, Terry and Fanny. Cookies and milk? Jenny asked, when John laughed. Come on, Ben. You know how to make cookies better than I do. When the replicator put out two dozen freshly made chocolate chip cookies that went down so particularly good with milk. Okay, Ben, how do we win the battle next week? If there are 120 of those big battleships, then we assign four to ten of the three 35s and 445s to each one. They go in like bats out of hell and take out the big guns. The 555 us, 665s, and 775s blow a hole in their windows, eliminating their primary controls. Then we turn on the little guys and wipe them out. 30 to 40 minutes should be all over. Chuck, Willie, and Lucy helped me on this by talking and them asking questions until we felt we had it right. Ben took a deep breath. We presented it to the girls, and they also helped by asking a lot of difficult questions. One question did come up. Why not just cut a two-hole in front of the controls and let all of the air out? We all agreed with that offensive procedure. Faster and easier. Good question on the control. I'd change the low-end time to 20 minutes. If we are flying at our potential, then there is not going to be much time in this battle. What if there are only 100 battleships present? We need a force set up to return to Earth to counter that possibility as soon as we know, Ben said. Makes sense, John agreed. Then squads one and two hit them next. Our big ships keep working down the line up to 120. The important thing is the little ships start on the left end, knocking out the cannons, and our bigger ships start on the right end, eliminating their controls. I'm looking for every battleship being damaged either by loss of guns or by loss of control within the first 10 minutes. We arrive at that point, then it's just a matter of cleaning up their little ships. I say it is just as important to take out the battleships first. Our 335s start on the left end, and our bigger ships go to the right. John nodded his approval. Keep it simple. Dad, we think you need to present it, Ben said. Okay, on one condition. We pull this off, the credit is going to come to me, and I am going to shift that credit to you guys, John said. Jenny smiled big. The next day, January the 14th. Admiral, it looks like we have a total of 754 ships if we leave the five on the Western carriers and have six on the Planetary Guard. The number does not include the seven LDs that the Chinese are building, but do not have completed yet. Tony said, and I'm not counting the one Poncho has. Thank you, Tony. Sure, you guys don't want something with more firepower? Admiral Mary asked. Two 775S and four 445S. Undermanned with not a lot of experience. All of us took all day Saturday and Sunday watching the tapes. Poke all of them in the eyes, then hit the secondary control on the big ones. We are not here to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with them. We're here to fight dirty and win. Tony laughed. If we get in trouble and part of the Golden Boys Brigade can join us with the six lasers, then I think we will be okay. Tony, you want your brothers and sisters with you? John asked. They were with us watching the tapes Saturday and Sunday. Tony thought for a second. If we face even three battleships, our odds of winning are less than yours, Dad. Your brothers and sisters have all worked hard to be in this battle. John said, their eyesight is excellent and have shown how good, time and again, that 20 miles with a six laser is easy for them. John thought for a second. I would say they are worth one or two battleships all by themselves. I see what you're saying. Yes, add them to the guard. Tony said, tell them I had choices and I requested them. Thanks, Tony, I will, John said. What else is there, Dad? Tony asked. The Navy computer modeling says we are going to experience a 23% loss of our ships. John looked incredibly sad. If you guys get hit with four or more battleships with support fighters, then you also may see some losses. Dad, we have shown this computer estimates wrong before. I trust God, I also trust U.S. 
Tony looked sure of himself. I hope you're right, son. I defiantly hope you're right. John smiled. All the ships that were in the pipeline in the U.S. and Russia were completed. It would be after the battle before another ship was made to fly. China was the exception. They had seven of the light destroyers partially built. Between Kevin at Lockheed and Vid in Russia, China had put over 10,000 people on their space program, converting them from their aeronautical industry. When they got the light destroyer and were asked to build them, they were ready, willing, and worked 24 sevens to do just that. Lockheed had taken delivery on two new Chinese LDs, and the one that Iceman flew had also been returned. Lockheed ran the three LDs through all the tests and all of them passed. Iceman had joined the OMIC camp and claimed the right to fly the LD. He was being brought up to speed. For a Top Gun, that only took Iceman three blinks in a heartbeat once he caught up on his sleep. Sid, the lead testing engineer, went to sign off on the three. His intuition was screaming at him. He looked at the Chinese tests and compared them with their tests. He shook his head and went to sign off again. He just couldn't even lift the pen. What could be the problem? He went there cool through the power needs, everything tested okay. He checked everything else. He'd sleep on it and sign the damn things in the morning. The next morning, while Sid was taking a shower, his mind for the third time went to the accumulator. Then a question came to his mind. When does the accumulator draw power from the primary power plant? Of course, the answer was after you fire, but we tested for maximum power usage. No, we did not. We never fired twice. Sid screamed, bringing his wife to see what the problem was. After firing once, then both the gun and the accumulator would be drawing a lot of power from the primary power supply. The primary power supply would be putting out 120%, and they only tested for 100%. Two hours later, Sid was one of those that if the boss were alone and the door was open, he could come in and sit down if he had a problem. Kevin Humphreys was busy working up the many hours spent on spacecraft. It looked like they were going to make a profit last month. Even with all the overtime, what do you have, Sid? Sid placed the cable with a magnifier on Kevin's desk. I need to order some new cables for the LDs. These cables we got from the Chinese are bogus, Sid said. How bad? Kevin asked as he looked at the end of the cable. The wire ends all looked like little donuts with a layer of silver on a copper core. We took it out to the testing range this morning. We put one of the Chinese LDs under load, raised it a foot off the ground, and fired 15 times. We hit the ground hard, hard enough to knock fillings loose. What's worse, the computer believes the primary power supply is still good, so we have life support only. I flipped the switch to the primary power to off, and the computer then flipped the switch to the secondary power supply to on, so we would have power to the floaty thing and engines. Floaty thing? Kevin asked. I picked that up from those damn jet plane engineers. I'm talking about the anti-gravity stabilization unit. I got my degrees from ASU, and I don't plan on calling it ASU anytime soon. I kind of like the name floaty thing myself. Um, um, uh, um. Kevin laughed. I do to when it's working. Sid also laughed. How much does the cabling cost? Kevin asked. There is about $40 per inch or two ounces per inch of silver in that cable. It retails for about $50 per inch. Sid said. How much per ship do we need? Ah, uh, Kevin asked. 50 feet of the cable would be equal to 600 inches, so we need 1,200 ounces of silver per ship. How long to get? Kevin asked. Two to three weeks if we put a rush on it. We don't have two or three weeks. Can we make our cable? Kevin asked. We do have a cable machine. We need silver though, Sid said. Come with me. Don't say a word until we are back out of the room with the door closed. Kevin led the two into a very secure room. Inside was a strange man. Hal, I need five boxes of silver. Okay, Mr. Humphreys, just sign on the line and state purpose and the amount at the end, Hal said. I'm going to borrow your hand truck. I promise to bring it back today, Kevin said. Okay, Mr. Humphreys. Have a nice day, Hal said. They loaded the five boxes of silver onto the hand truck. The door closed and locked again. Does Hal need some WD-40? Sid asked. Kevin laughed at the referral of the Wizard of O.C. and the Tin Man. I hope not. Our guy that does the programming for the holograms brought him. 
He is an industrial mobile robotic AI. He said Google and Amazon had orders for thousands of them before the earth changes. He didn't even see me. Sid said, what's that all about? Not enough RAM. The same thing happens in our spaceships. Both Patricia and Virginia are there until the 775 ship gets underway. Then they just disappear until the journey is over, Kevin said as they headed for his office. Once they got there, Kevin gave Sid the control of the hand truck. Bring it back to me today, please, or Hal may have a meltdown. Kevin laughed. Hal needs a bath in warm, soapy water, Sid teased. Please leave Hal's hygiene to me, Kevin laughed. I'll get him some brute aftershave. 24 hours later, Sid the engineer signed off on the three LDs. An email and a blow-up picture showing one of their wires with a copper core was sent to General Chang of the Spaceship Division of the Chinese Army, telling of the 80% copper core of what was supposed to be 100% silver wire used on the LDs. Later that day, three men were arrested for committing fraud on the Chinese military. General Chong got the opportunity to take the three men to God. The case closed with a note the men would never be available again to sell to the Chinese military. Flight training and classes were going 16 or more hours every day. The Battle of Worlds. The day started at midnight, Moscow time, at the beginning of January 20, 2019. The 335S all had a portable potty in them. All the 335S and 445S had been upgraded to withstand bigger charges. All the known problems with wiring had been resolved. The Golden Jets all had been upgraded along with a six laser added to their arsenals and painted a golden yellow. The final numbers for Earth were the 728 ships plus the Golden Boy Squadron of 79 for a total of 807 ships leaving 16 ships in reserve, 15 555S, and one Golden Jet. Against Earth were 120 battleships with 3,011 black jets for a total of 3,131 ships. Three 555S took off as a group towards Venus. The Brain Trust, Presidents John, Vid, and Admiral Mary, decided five million miles from Earth was close enough. That was just past the first battle site with the Nanooks. All the Earth's ships had black boxes in them and had been tried out. The favorite trip was around Pluto. Even with the black box, a 335 could only travel 13.4 light years per day. A 445 could do twice that at 26.8 light years per day. Five million miles was a drop in the bucket compared to a light year. Iceman was out in the LD. Lockheed had given it the once over. It appeared to be a sound vessel. The Admiral hung the rank of Major on him. He called back to Earth, Lockheed, that 14 of the battleships with support had broken off and made a different heading that could still lead to Earth. Kevin at Lockheed called up John and passed the information on. Admiral Kennedy went to Plan B-1. She called up Major Sy and passed the plan change on to him. C sent the second and third companies to join the Earth Guard. Both companies had a way to go. They were halfway to Venus. The Admiral also contacted Tony, letting him know about the 14 battleships and 40 to 50 support ships coming at them. No one knows why, but one of the battleships fired off in the direction of the three 555S. They were out about 20 miles and cloaked, but with minimal energy being used. The screens were at 50%. When the battleship fired, the screens automatically went to full. At 20 miles, the big gun simply tickled the 555S. What it did do was show the number and size of the 555S to the Nanus that they were all alone. They sent six of the black jets out. 555S, I am Major Iceman. On my mark, fire at those six black jets. Iceman let the black jets get halfway. Fire until they are junk. 19 lasers, six energy cannons, and the anti-mater gun on the light destroyer fired. In seconds, the six black jets were junk. About a mile behind the three 555 SS, a body of ships showed up. All the battleships fired at the line of Earth ships. Evasive action, Admiral Kennedy ordered. Implement Plan B-1. Plans A, B, and C were all the same as far as executing this part of the battle. Plan B protected the Earth more than A and C did more than B. Plans B and C also had 10 of the reserve ships filled with minute men head for the guard stations around the Earth. The battleships could not fire straight up, 
so a ship could fly 100 yards above the battleships and fire down into the control tower. The two things the Nanook ships could not stop were the lasers and the antimatter guns. Within five minutes, 79 of the battleships had their primary controls destroyed. Their secondary controls were in the main body of the ship under the area between the topmost rear gun and the secondmost rear gun. It cloaked 335, hid beside the destroyed primary, and fired its laser down between the two guns, cutting a 24 hole out of the armored plating. The cutout plate fell into the hole and out came all the air from the main part of the ship. The Golden Boys were finding out that their laser was a whole lot more effective than their beefed-up cannon. They were attacking the Royal Yacht. It took 30 seconds to dismantle the primary control. Captain Sai was leading a group along the length of the big battleship. An enormous gun fired and the pilot dipped right into another of the big guns firing. Susan Garrett was riding along. She was sitting in the center watching the action when they got hit. For a few seconds she couldn't think, then she said, Sai! She yelled again and forced herself to look. Everyone was down. Go to God! Go to God! Go to God! She said as she passed out. Jenny looked at the new arrivals. She recognized Susan. Susan's still breathing. Let's get the rest of them breathing. No injuries. It looks like they've been short-circuited. Ada was learning on the job. She placed her left hand on Major Sai and got a major shock. She kept it there and touched God with her right hand and grounded Sai out. He's ready. She went on to the next one and did the same. None of the four men were breathing. Jenny would fix that. At the planet, here they come. Company two of the Golden Boys was behind Jesus in the 445. Brad and his team in the 775 were above the battleships with everything off except for life support and cloaking. So far, they had not been noticed. Brad had the kids lined up to take out four primary controls and two secondary controls. Lord Heat was pointing at number seven. He was going to hit it hard between the hash one and hash two guns, then go on to battleship hash six and hope to do the same for it in hash five. The Black Jets and the Golden Boys were about even. Go get them, Golden Brigade. Jesus yelled as he hit the primary control on hash four. As Hedy moved over to number five, his ship was just far enough towards the front to get hit by the hash one gun. His dad was firing the laser Lockheed had installed. He finished the opening in the glass for the control when they got hit. Exmon was not breathing. Hedy had no power even though the green light was on for the primary. He turned everything off then turned on the secondary power. It turned green. He hit the shielding and cloaking and moved off. Then he thought, the accumulators have got to be charged up enough to fire the cannon once. Heedy moved the ship back over the Hash-5 battleship and got one shot between the Hash-1 and Hash-2 guns blowing the hell out of the deck. Now he headed away from the action. Lord Heat, Jesus called. Got to get Dad to God. Got hit hard. Got to go to God. Lord Heat, hang on a second. We're coming. Brian, you are with me. Jerry, one of the cadets. Take control. I'll be back ASAP. Jesus made the transport into Lord Heat's LD. Brian was with him. Take your dad go. Major, I don't know how, Hetty said. Brian, get the ship to Lockheed. It needs a fix. Jesus said, use the chair that Exmon was in. Yes, sir. Brian was climbing until Hetty grabbed him and gently put him in the chair they had made for his dad. The main floor had been taken out so Hetty could stand while running the ship. See the three of us with God, Jesus told Lord Heat, then smiled. The transport happened. He's not breathing. Hetty came face to face with his mother. They looked at each other for a minute. Even though she was six feet shorter, it was still the mom. Are we winning, son? Rosaola asked. Yes, we were battling seven of those battleships. We had damaged the last one when their cannon got us. I went back and took it out. Good. Now let's go get my husband back. Roseola went over and jabbed Exmon between the legs with her right hand with her left hand was over his heart. He took a deep breath, opened his eyes, then looked around until he saw Rosola. He gave her the biggest smile he could muster. Exmon, talk to Lord Bible about who Hash 3 is. Thank you, Father. With Tony and Willa over eastern China, when Tony realized he had seven of the fourteen battleships coming at him, he called for help. Ben, make this thing dance, okay? Tony yelled. Buckle up, crew. We're going to dance. Ben also yelled. 
Willie, start on the left of the battleships. Take out the primary controls. Lucy, you do the same starting on the right. Tony ordered, the rest of you take out those fighters. Tony got calls from the two LDs at Lockheed. They were on the way. He got a call from General Chang. He was bringing up all five of his LDs. Tony also got a call from Admiral Wiggins. He was bringing up the five of the 335 Etsu he had in his command. The third company of the Golden Boys was also on the way. He had five of the reserve 555s also on the way. Tony thought, hell in five minutes I could take on the whole universe. He was loving Zeus. This was the ship Vid would get if it survived. Major Tony, how can we help? A voice from the past with a Spanish accent asked. Willa caught Tony's eye and smiled. Governor Poncho, can you see us on your scanner? Tony asked. Yes, you look like a bird. Come over near us and sit above us about 150 feet. Keep those black jets off us as we take on the big guys. Will do, Tony. General Chang arrived next. Major Taylor, what is left? Sir, please start with the battleships. The primary controls are destroyed. The secondary controls are under the deck between the first and second guns. One good shot of antimatter should take the life out of them. Watch out for those cannons on the deck. Tony shared. The five Chinese LDs did just what they needed to do. General Chong had gotten one and was just a bit sloppy when he went to pick on his hash too. They hit him hard twice. Chang wore the black lanyard. He was part of the new wave in China. He touched his lanyard just as he passed out. Three seconds later, his ship blew up as it got hit again and again. The Golden Boys had arrived and took on the 12 or 13 black jets that were left. The four remaining LDs used the occasion to shoot at battleships. Ben let loose with a war hoop. Tony and Willa looked at each other. She flew over and plopped onto Tony's lap. Not bad for a bunch of darn kids, Willa said. Major Taylor, this is Admiral Wiggins. Are you okay? Yes, sir. That was the most intense five minutes of my life. Look, Admiral, seven battleships, 25 black jets, and one light destroyer from our side, Tony said as he looked at all the junk floating in space. Major Taylor, how did you do it? My brothers and sisters and wife are the most gung-ho people I have ever heard of or seen anywhere. Tony laughed. Governor Batista, how many did you get? We got five Tony, Poncho reported. Tony could hear the celebrations in the background. Is Willie and Ben with you? Admiral Wiggins asked. Yes, one moment, sir, Tony said. Poncho, who was with you? My brother, my son, Colonel Brownie, and several of our leaders, Poncho answered. Hello, Admiral Wiggins, sir. Hello, Governor Poncho, sir, came from all the kids as they continued to yell it up. Sounds like a bunch that just won a war, Admiral Wiggins yelled back. Admiral Wiggins, we met once. This is Governor Poncho. I'm very glad for you to be here helping our Tony. Back at the main battle near Venus, Sam had the 665 named Rick. He had asked the Marines if they wanted to fight as a unit. They were all for it. He also had Governor John Nation and his wife and brother, and his brother's wife. His son was also behind a gun. When Sam turned off the cloak, Admiral Mary called, Sam, what are you doing? Mary's totem was the Wise Owl. Wise Owl has the forces ready to shoot. We are going to end this. Sam changed channels. Earth forces, all 555S, follow me. First pass, we will be doing 500 miles per hour. We are going to finish the primaries on the battleships, then eliminate the secondaries. Making my run. Vid sent his 555s to follow Sam on his run. Dimitri also had a 665 and came in behind the column. Sally Taylor was with him. Sam stayed about 1,000 yards away. The primaries were simple. Blast two or more six or seven holes in their windows and watch as the air and debris exhausted the windows they would blow out. Colonel Stanley also had a 665 full of 82nd personnel and pulled in behind Dimitri with the Russians. As he made a sweeping 180-degree turn, he realized he had over 200 ships following him. Sam heard over the channel the Golden Boys were headed towards him to help. This time, boys and girls, let's take out the secondary controls. Sam was just about to turn the 665 known as Rick when two of the black jets collided in front of them. Sam pulled up and grazed one of them, which sent the 665 into a tumble. The hit was just hard enough to knock all systems offline. Sam, Admiral Mary screamed, I'm okay, just got a bloody nose. 
in the background. Warning, loss of ship atmosphere containment. Got to go. Rick, activate the portable seal, Sam said in a normal voice. Seal activated. Sometimes a minute seems to take hours. Rick finally said, atmosphere returning to normal. A cheer went up on the Rick. Rick, how much of the patch is left? 50%, sir, Rick reported. Sam called Admiral Mary. The patch works just fine. Head home, Colonel. Mary said, be prepared to abandon ship, Sam. Aye, aye, Admiral. Love you. Then Sam got serious. Colonel Stanley lead one more charge. Will do, sir, and good shooting, Sam. Forming up now. Virginia, how many of the black jets are present in this battle? Mary asked. 2,411 black jets either flying or destroyed, Virginia reported. How many battleships? Mary was feeling panicky. 103 battleships, Admiral. Earth forces around Earth, battle plan F3. I repeat F3. All Earth Nanooks forces go to F3. I repeat F3. Mary asked Virginia, how many enemy ships here in front of us that are still operational? Battleships 4, 3, 2, 1. None that are operational. Black Jets 476, 543, 2, 1, 470. All 775 S and 885 SO move at best speed to wave A3. I repeat, all 775 UAs and 885 S move at best speed to FF3. Admiral Kennedy out. Colonel Stanley, are you ready to take over here? Yes, sir, came the reply. Ready and willing. It's all yours, Colonel. We have another 600 jets and three battleships to go find. 10-4 will clean up this area of space. Colonel Stanley rattled off. Ten minutes later, near Venus, it took a few seconds for the realization to sink in that the battle was over. Then the cheer went up throughout the fleet. Planet Earth had done exceptionally well in the battle. Colonel Stanley estimated they had lost 10% of their forces. There, before Colonel Stanley and his forces, were thousands of Nanook ships floating in space. Slowly, the dead ships were starting to move inch by inch towards the sun. With God. Ma'am, I understand the President's First Lady is here. Can you direct me so I can meet her? General Chong asked. He was on a cot at the end of a long line of cots. The woman he was talking to was very pregnant. She was helping one of his men sit up and drink some water. Nearby was this very enormous, young-looking lady. She, too, was helping a man sit up as a young boy passed out bottles of water. What would you say to the First Lady of the U.S.? Jenny asked him. Thank you for my life and the protection of my people. General Chang smiled as he said, How is the war going? You're the last to show up. How is your part of our war? Jenny asked. She took off the latex gloves she had on. She looked at them and wondered again why she put up with them. A relic of a past age. Jenny put her right hand out. Are you a leader? As the two people shook hands. Yes, Mom. I am General Chang Director of the Chinese Space Program. Chang looked down the line of cots that seemed to go on forever. Hundreds of volunteers were working with the people on the cots. We met at the meeting where China and India became part of the Space Committee for Earth. Did anybody die? Jenny went and touched God. Father, did any of the earthlings or golden boys die today? None that you don't know about, and all were brought back to life. How many have we reunited with their physical bodies? Jenny asked. 247 of the 517 that have needed assistance that was out of their physical bodies. Thank you, Father. Jenny turned to General Chang. I am First Lady of the U.S., Jennifer Taylor. Jenny went to sit in a Christport. The young boy was there. Joey, can you bring two bottles of the special water to me, please? Sure thing, Doc. Joey ran off and returned with two large bottles. Thank you, Joey. Jenny handed one to General Chang. She took the top off the second bottle and chugged the entire 24-ounce bottle. Jenny leaned back and closed her eyes for five seconds. I got myself dehydrated. That feels much better. Hi, Mommy. Willie kissed Jenny on her cheek. Why are you here, Second Lieutenant? Jenny asked. Tony was wondering if General Chang was okay. Willie said, his ship blew up. I'm General Chang. The man did a high five with Willie. Did we win? Yup, sir. It was apparent Willie was still burning adrenaline. We beat them really well. Well, General Chang, you and your men were the last that came to God today. 
Hopefully, it is over time or, or uh, Jenny was hugging Willie as she said this. Earth forces moving to comply with the F3 order. Tony, what is F3? Gloria asked. Oh, oh, that means we have another enemy group that has broken away from the main battle. Virginia, formulate a plan to get us one million miles from Earth in the direction of Venus now. Tony and his group were just coming together. It looked like he was getting his wish they would take on a much larger force. Tony's 775 followed the four Chinese LD's 885s and the two from Lockheed to the designated location. Along behind came the third company of the Golden Boys and five of the reserve 555s plus 2445S and Governor Poncho and Admiral Wiggins with his 5335S. Willa added up the number of ships and came to around 45. Tony, we have a good force here. Now if all of us can get into the fight, Admiral Wiggins, please lead the way, Governor Poncho suggested. The 6335s all took the lid off their black boxes and circling the earth and going a million miles past in seconds. The six light destroyers all arrived in the designated area first. Iceman and his joined the six, making them seven. Haiti had transported to Lockheed. He and Brian met, and his ship checked out okay. They heard the change of plans and headed to the rendezvous point for the F-3 plan. Now there were eight LDs. The 775S were next. Vid and Dimitri met John, Tony Jasushus with Admiral Kennedy arriving seconds later. The Earth Forces had nine of the 775S. Earth Forces, I want all of the 775s in a row confronting that mass of ships coming our way. Admiral Kennedy took a deep breath. Light destroyers, grouped together 10 miles to my left and 10 miles in the direction of the oncoming enemy. When the time comes, please fire your antimatter cannons in a coordinated spread across their middle. Sam, are you still here? Mary asked. Somebody put out a top priority call. What if I sit over the 775S and help keep the bandits off? Sam asked. I agree, Sam. Golden Brigade forms up on my right, 10 miles from my ship and 9 miles towards the oncoming enemy, Mary ordered. A woman's voice came over the speaker. Admiral, I am Janet Thompson. I followed Reverend John Taylor out of Seattle. I'm with Captain Bird of the Golden Boys. He says this may be the ruler of Nenos coming at us, and if it is, then this is the elite guard. They have the best ships and training of men. This may be more of an equal fight. Thank you, Miss Thompson. Admiral Kennedy paused for a count of three. 335S, 445S, and 555S go for the battleships. Form up 10 miles to my left. Once the battleships are disabled, form up behind the enemy and come at them from their back. The second company of Golden Boys came in and joined up with the others. Five more 555S moved to be behind the enemy by about 10 miles following them in. The 335S, 445S, and 555S that were with Jesus showed up and joined the battleship attack group 10 miles to the left of the Admiral. All ships go to cloak, Admiral Kennedy put out. This is Admiral Kennedy calling Captain Byrd, Admiral Wiggins, Prez 1 and 2, Major Iceman go to PV-1, and Lord Heat. After all, had made known they were on PV-1, channel 47651-1-3. Do any of you see anything else we need to do? Please realize we have only 14 minutes for this discussion and implementing any changes? Admiral Kennedy asked. None? Was heard from many. Admiral Wiggins voiced his thinking. Good job, Admiral. Janet Thompson spoke. The King's Honor Guard will fight to the last one. Permission to destroy all ships? We would like one to see if there is anything new we can incorporate into our ships, John stated. Okay, we go with what we have. Please switch back to our standard channel, and good luck to you all, Admiral Kennedy said. The main channel for the Earth Forces, this is Admiral Kennedy. All ships move one mile to my right, ASAP. That consumed ten of the minutes for the Earth Forces. LDs, start your firing. The LDs fired 103 times each into the center of their battlefield, right where the Nanook fleet would be heading. They had their battleships surrounded by the black jets in a six-sided formation. About 100 of the black jets in front, then five more layers behind the front. Five minutes later, Admiral Mary announced, All units prepare to fire on three. One, two, and three. 2,000 lasers fired, 
with almost 300 energy cannons. The blast of the cloud of antimatter was enormous. It filled a cubic mile or more with destruction. No one had seen an atomic bomb go off, but all agreed what they had seen had to be equal to that. The blast burned for 15 seconds, leaving nothing but a cloud of dust. Tony clicked on his mic to say something. In the background, Willie screamed, Wow, we got them! Because there was no air, there was no wave from the blast, only a layer of dust that hit the screens and burned up. John heard what Willie said and smiled. He remembered the four hours he had sat with Hayati, Iceman, Vid, Mary, Sam, Colonel Stanley, Major Psy, Kevin from Lockheed, and six of his engineers held a class teaching everyone about the capabilities of all the ships and their weapons. They had every pilot they could fit into the space around the president's table at Sue's. Every ship had been gone over, then the light destroyers was talked about. John chuckled again as Hetty raised his hand. There's something you don't know about the antimatter. Please share Lord Hetty. Mary smiled. There is one more setting on the control knob that does not have a designation. Hetty looked around. Everybody was interested. When I first got to Funston, I was pestered by pirates. The first time it was only one ship, they hit me with an energy weapon. My power was off. I hit the secondary, and when they got within range, I fired the antimatter cannon ten times. The ship exploded and disappeared. The second pirate ship that came at me, I fired once, and half the ship disappeared from the blast. The third time they were upon me, before I realized it, three of them, two were about a mile away. My ship had no power. I turned the setting to what I thought was wide dispersal of antimatter. I realized later I was in a place where there was no designation. I turned on the secondary and aimed and fired. I was going to fire a guy in when both ships blew up. They were 200 yards apart. I took them out with one shot. The third ship must have gone to light speed because it just disappeared. I volunteer to test out Lord Heedy's findings to see if our ship has the same capabilities. Iceman offered. Yes, Iceman. Admiral Mary said, then asked, How many shots of antimatter is there for the LDs? The magazine holds 100 shots. But as one is fired, the gun starts manufacturing another round of antimatter, Haiti said with Iceman nodding his head. How fast to create another round? Mary asked. About 30 seconds. So, if we had nine light destroyers, we could put out a cloud of antimatter possible enough to cover a cubic mile of space like a landmine. Colonel Sam, have your men transport home. Order Rick to fly to Lockheed. Transport here to Virginia. Mary ordered, I want you here, please. Colonel Stanley, is that you out there? Mary asked. Yes, sir. When we had reduced the numbers to less than 50 black jets, I left Captain Tree in charge and grabbed the 555S to join you. Colonel Stanley advised. Second and third companies of the Golden Brigade, please move at best speed to make sure first company is okay, Mary ordered. Admiral Kennedy, please cancel that order. I am Captain Tree. We only lost one more ship. There is no more enemy left here. How is your battle? Mr. President, do you want to make an announcement? Mary asked as she held Sam's hand. Your turn, Vid, John laughed. Earth forces and our friend Lord Heat. This war is over, Vid laughed. I'm buying lunch for everyone today at Sue's. John announced, Seth, are you still with us? What happened, President John? Seth, we made a landmine out of many hundreds of shots of antimatter. John laughed as he looked at a scared Seth, the newspaper man. OMG! 